Oh, I'm going to get off. I'm going to get out. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Gamera, Yongari, the X from outer space. What do these three titanic rubber suited creatures have in common? Yup, they were all created to cash in on the success of Toho Studios Godzilla, a monster that set fire to both the Japanese box office and a bunch of miniature towns in Japan. With Godzilla vs Kong upon us, let's take a look at what has to be the weirdest Godzilla ripoff ever made. Pulgasari. Everything from how it was made to the contents of the movie itself almost sounds made up, but I swear it's all true. It all started with a kidnapping. Shin Sang-ok was a pretty well-regarded director in the 50s and 60s in South Korea. His production company created award-winning successful films and was involved in making over 300 movies in the 1960s alone. For a while, he was dubbed the Prince of Korean Cinema, which is a pretty dope title if I say so myself, and he was even responsible for filming the first on-screen kiss in a South Korean movie. In the 1954 film titled Jiokwa, aka A Flower in Hell. However, after a string of flops in the 1970s along with restrictions placed on him by the government, seemed to sour his affection for the movie industry a bit. But that was nothing compared to what would come next. Shin sang -ok had previously been married to actor Che Eun-hee, who also won various awards for her work. They got divorced in 1976 due to a few scandals, and two years later, in 1978, she disappeared. As it turns out, she'd gone to Hong Kong under false impressions of directing a film and had been kidnapped by the North Korean government. Shin sang Hok went to look for her, only to be kidnapped by North Korean government himself six months after Che Eun-hee's kidnapping and in the same place, Hong Kong. They were also not reunited immediately. For half a decade, Shim was held against his will with no idea that his ex-wife was even alive. Now, you might be asking yourself, why the hell had the two been abducted in the first place? Hmm, great question. Well, you see, dear viewers, it's because Kim Jong-il, the late supreme leader of North Korea, loved movies. Going back to 1966, Kim Jong-il, desperate to continue to impress his father, Kim Il-sung, the late, late supreme leader of North Korea, joined the propaganda and agitation department, and in four years became director of the motion pictures and arts division. That meant that he was now in charge of the creation of North Korean films. He realized that movies could be a powerful medium when it came to indoctrinating people with ideas and ensuring that they followed what ever the Democratic People's Republic of Korea wanted them to follow. But there was just one problem. Most of the North Korean films being made were kind of awful. Despite the fact that there were heavy, heavy restrictions on the types of movies that people could see, Kim Jong-il, being the son of the big dog supreme leader, said screw that and managed to amass a collection of roughly 50 15,000 movies, ranging from stuff like James Bond, Rambo, Godzilla, Indiana Jones, and more. He adored movies, particularly the adventure genre. Sadly, he felt that the efforts of his country had fallen behind the rest of the world. While other countries were producing groundbreaking works of art, the films produced under his watch seemed you know, stale and lackluster. Thus, the only logical solution is, I guess, kidnapping. Not so fun fact, Che Eun-hee, the ex-wife of the director, was only kidnapped specifically so that they could kidnap Shin sang -ok. Yes, she was basically used like a bait. And though Shin sang -ok at first refused to make films and even tried to escape his captures twice, which resulted in him being imprisoned for two years, he was eventually released. Okay, so the story gets a little stranger. After he was released, he met up with Kim Jong-il over a fancy dinner where he was finally. After like five years of being kidnapped and held against their will, Shin Sang-hok was reunited with his ex-wife Chen Hee. And later, on Kim Jong-il's recommendation, uh, they remarried. Yeah. 
I told you it'd get a little strange. According to Shin sang -ok, Kim Jong-il eventually granted him his own studio. He also never gave notes and never visited the sets. Also, when Shin sang -ok wasn't making movies, he and old Kimmy boy just mostly watched movies together. I guess that's nice. Yes. During this time, Shin sang -ok ended up making seven movies under Kim's eyes, ranging from romances to musicals to stories of political conflicts and war. And not only were they successful in North Korea, but they even earned actual awards worldwide. Shin sang -ok himself have said that his 1984 film Talchulgi, also known in the West as Runaway, was one of the high points of his entire career. Maybe that was because for the ending of the film, they had had to have a scene of an exploding train. And after Shin joked about filming that scene with a real life train, the absolute mad lad Kim Jong Il just, just, just went and did that. They got a real train and just put explosives in him, put him down the rails, and then kablam, the scene was shot. Also, fun fact, did you know that Taichulgi soundtrack features cover versions of the Swedish pop group ABBA? Now I'm just, I'm just imagining North Korean ABBA cover group Doing, doing Mamma Mia. The seventh film, though, was gonna be a little different. During this time over in Japan, Toho Studios had released the return of Godzilla, bringing forth a new Godzilla for the new Heisei era, released in December 15th, 1984, reigniting the franchise, turning Godzilla into a city stomping jerk again and unleashing him on an unsuspecting Tokyo. The film wasn't a huge success though, but it did well enough that it propelled an entire new generation of Godzilla films. And Kim Jong il wanted to do that. Bum, 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 bum. Bum, bum, bum. Bum, 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 bum. Unlike some monster movies, Godzilla has always found international appeal, and Kim felt it was necessary to create a movie that not only wild North Koreans, but Americans as well. And though North Korea and Japan had been at Odds for decades at this point, Kim Jong-il was eager to bring in some of the talent behind that recent Godzilla film in order to make his own monster flick happen. So with that, tricked into thinking that they were shooting a film in China, stuntman Kenpachiro Satsuma, special effects wizard Teriyoshi Nakano, and the rest of the crew were dropped into North Korea. Now, some other sources say that Shin sang -ok had let them know that they were filming in North Korea and guaranteed their safety. But however they did it, they got him there. They were in North Korea. Just a year after donning the Godzilla costume for the first time in the return of Godzilla, Satsuma would star as the Big G's ripoff in Purgasari. So what exactly is the story of this legendary North Korean bootleg radioactive lizard that took to kidnappings. Well, once upon a time, in feudal Korea during the Goryeo dynasty, a vicious king keeps his peasants miserable and starving. One day, he orders the blacksmith to create weapons using metal goods taken from the peasants. Refusing the order, the blacksmith is imprisoned and on the verge of death, he creates a little monster figurine with the food it was given and prays to the gods to give power to protect the poor. He kicks the bucket and later the blacksmith's daughter gets some blood on the small kaiju figurine and then BAM! The monster comes to life and she names it Brugazari, which is the name of the beast that her father told her about as a young child. The monster constantly grows after eating metal and once it reaches regular dude size it just starts fighting alongside the peasants against the evil king. I gotta say seeing a giant monster who isn't giant yet just Hanging out with people is kind of funny to me. And it pretty much wrecks everything that the king and anyone else has to offer. The lizard is stacked. However, the king kidnaps the blacksmith's daughter and threatening her life, ends up catching this horned giant lizard off guard. They try to bury Pulgasari underground because he eats metal, not dirt. And uh, they just call it a win. Uh, the king won, Pulgasari, um, it's like a, like a million. But the blacksmith's daughter revives Pugatari with her blood in the same way that she brought him to life earlier in the film. Then the metal-eating reptile destroys the king's palace and just stomps the king out. A nice win for the peasants. But unlike Godzilla, who usually gets done with his quest and then just kinda trudges into the Pacific Ocean, this big god lizard just 
kind of sticks around and eats more and more metal, leading to the peasants having to give up their metal goods much like the same problem they had with the king. And so, in a kind of revolutionary move, the movie characters have to figure out what to do with a giant monster that just won't leave. He's a good guy, that Bulgazari, but he's just too dang big and just won't stop nibbling on their metal stuff. The daughter realizes that this metal-loving giant alligator is eventually becoming the overwhelming villain that he'd been created to stop. So she does what we all should do in a situation like this. She hides in a giant bell and waits for Pulgasari to eat her. Pulgasari does this and then pretty quickly realizes that he's made a terrible mistake. Then he just crumbles into dust and explodes at the same time. Then we see a baby Pulgasari turn into a glowing blue orb and zip into the dead daughter reviving her. A uh, lot of revivals in this movie, uh, then we get the the end. And that is the great story of Pulgasari. And if you know anything about North Korea, the story of a poor anti-capitalist country that ends up defeating an evil king and becoming their own powerhouse sounds right up in their alley. But aside from the fact that Pulgasari is kind of ridiculous, the monster effects themselves look pretty akin to what the Godzilla films look like. 20 years before. Basically, Pulgasari would be an incredible technical achievement in 1965 instead of 1985. But Kim Jong-il absolutely loved it, holding a feast to honor the filmmakers and their success. But rather than following it up with Pulgasari vs. Robo Pulgasari or whatever, the two plan to follow Pulgasari's success with a movie about Genghis Khan. Shin sang -ok and Kim even planned to try and get it an international release. Kim also felt that it would help revitalize North Korea's economy, which was in a drastic slump at the time. However, the efforts would require the cooperation of other countries, meaning that Shin sang -ok and Chae Eun-hee would have to travel outside of North Korea in order to finalize the deals. This is where they would make their escape. Dun, 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 dun. March 12th, 1986 in Vienna, Austria. Under the pretense of meeting a Japanese movie critic for an interview, they convinced their North Korean bodyguards to leave the room. And then they got on a cab, got chased, got out the taxi during a traffic jam, and ran their way to the American embassy. Also, I do want to add some more info uh, to this insane story. So, Shin sang -ok and Chan actually secretly recorded their conversations with Kim Jong-il as evidence that they were indeed held against their will. One of the recordings has Kim Jong-il admit to the kidnappings, and in the same convo told the movie lover pair that they should have a press conference to say that they were indeed in North Korea of their free will. That press conference happened a few months later in Yugoslavia. Yeah, totally, totally of their free will. After that whole ordeal, they lived under CIA protection for three years, and afterwards, the two moved to Los Angeles. It was there that Shin Sang-ok became involved with a series that I heard 90s US kids are probably familiar with, the three ninja films. Coming up with the idea after watching Home Alone repeatedly and using the pseudonym Simon Sheen, Shin Sang-ok ended up writing Three Ninjas Kickback, directed Three Ninjas Knuckle Up, and produced Three Ninjas High Noon at Mega Mountain. He even wrote his own ripoff of Bugasari called The Adventures of Galgameth, which I guess is a rip ripoff of of Godzilla. And uh, finally, after about 20 years, in 1999, he'd returned to his home country of South Korea, where he lived until the end of his life. So, how did Kim Jong-il take all of this? And what happened to Pulgasari? Well, Kim wasn't super enthusiastic about the pair escaping, to say the least. He had their names taken off the films and banned them from ever being released again. And since Pulgasari had only just recently been released in North Korea, that meant that not many people ever got to see it. It never saw an outside release until 1998, when it finally made its Tokyo premiere. However, it didn't do very well in Seoul, South Korea's largest city, a population of about 9 million people, only about 1,000 people saw it. But unlike Bulgasari itself, the legacy of the film wouldn't crumble or 
explode. Rather, it became a cult hit in its own right. Bootleg tapes of it were passed around, then ADV Films, the anime distribution company that many fans probably spent $200 on at Suncoast Video for an Evangelion DVD with two episodes on it, released it on official VHS in 2001. Since then, there have been screenings around the world, usually promoting it with a mix of this movie's nuts and the story behind this movie is crazy. It even got an entire book written about it. Paul Fish's A Kim Jong-il Production, the extraordinary true story of a kidnapped filmmaker, his star actress, and a young dictator's rise to power. Golly, that is a light novel title length. Uh, it's pretty good. Check it out if you're into reading things. In the end, Kim Jong-il, who once wrote an entire book about filmmaking called On the Art of Cinema, never really got his massive monster movie hit. One that would save North Korea financially, reflect its leadership's morals, and also bring esteem to their films and culture. Instead, he got a movie about a giant creature that eats a lady in a bell and then explodes randomly. And uh, that's kind of what you're asking for when you kidnap your filmmakers. So I guess the message you can get out of this is don't abduct people, even if you do desperately want to make a giant monster film. I guess, uh, I guess that's always a good rule to live by. And that is the end of this strange little tale about a North Korean Godzilla knockoff. Yeah, sounded all so simple at the start and now look at ya. Learned a whole kidnapping and escape thriller movie plotline with some history about North Korean cinema all in one sitting. Fantastic. Well, if you guys like this content, please be sure to subscribe and if you want to see more right now, click these rectangles that usually pop up near the end and uh, let me know in the comments down below who do you think would win Godzilla or King Monkey let me know and uh, yeah well Jesus what the hell <laughs> <laughs>